You all keep one another in your prayers. I know there's lots of folks going through physical things here, Lisa and Kathy and so many others, you know. Uh, anyway, it's good to be in the Lord's house. He's our healer. He's our healer. And, you know, the Apostle Paul said to live is Christ, to die is gain. So if I live or die, I win. It's a it's a it's a win win situation. Amen. This morning, I want to talk a little bit. The the the, the word that just you know I was thinking about all week is the word mercy. It's of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Mercy. Uh, when we partake of the Lord's table, we're celebrating His mercy. In Psalm eighty nine. And we're not, you don't have to turn there with me. We're not going to really preach on that. But the psalmist writes, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. His mercy is forever. He's the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The same God that was there before the creation of everything is the same God that has love and mercy for us today. When we partake of the Lord's table, we celebrate his mercy. Uh, now, the passage I want you to turn with me to is over in the book of Lamentations. Uh, that's right between Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And it's a very popular passage. They wrote a couple songs off this passage. Uh, and it's going to be chapter 3. And we're going to start with verse 22, but before we do, I always like to put things in context. It's important that we understand the word in context. If you know the story, you Bible scholars out there, you know the prophet Jeremiah who wrote the book of Lamentations. He wrote his prophecy and he wrote Lamentations. He was a prophet to the nation of Judah, the city of Jerusalem. And when he was a prophet to that city, that city had fallen so far away from what God had intended them to be. You know, that Jerusalem was and is the place where Jesus is going to reign when he returns. He's going to come back. He's not going to come back to Washington, D.C. He's going to come back to the Mount of Olives when he sets his feet on this earth, to the Mount of Olives, and he's going to reign. He's going to sit in David's seat which is the throne in Jerusalem. He's going to rule the world from Jerusalem for a thousand years. That's called the millennium, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So Jerusalem is a very important city to God and always has been from the very beginning. Melchizedek, way back in the book of Genesis, was the prince of Salem, uh, Jerusalem. And um, so it's a very important city. And he gave that city to his chosen people, Israel. That's where Solomon built a temple. And if you read about Solomon's temple, it was a, just a glorious uh, temple. Gold and silver and brass. and uh, It was very ornate and very, uh, very opulent. And that was where, that's where they went to worship. That's where the priests would bring the offerings and the sacrifice. That's where the Ark was. The Ark of the Covenant, the Golden Ark of the Covenant that we re read about in the Old Testament. That's where they kept it. And it was a glorious place. And when they, when they built that temple... Uh, Solomon had a dedication service for that temple. And the power of God came down, and you can read about it in Chronicles and, and uh, Kings and so forth. The power of God came down, and the smoke filled the temple, and they couldn't stand it. It was a glorious time, and God heard Solomon's prayer, and he answered, and he said, listen, as long as you are true to me, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to provide for you, but whenever you start turning from me, you're going to lose the benefits of my protection. You're going to lose the promises I've given you. This is a, a, an if-then covenant that he had with uh, the nation of Israel. If you obey me, I'll bless you. If you refuse to obey me, I'll remove my hand of blessing. And what God would do in his mercy is that he would send prophets when they started to get off track and when they started to veer. He would send prophets to warn them, to try to urge them to come back. Isaiah, in the beginning of his prophecy, he said, speaking for the Lord, he said, come let us reason together. Come and let's talk about this. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. God offered mercy to them over and over and over again. And there were times that they would listen for a little while, and then they would turn their backs on God again, and they began to worship other gods and so forth. And by the time that Jeremiah came on the picture, 
Jeremiah had the unenviable task of being a prophet to a nation that had turned its back on God to such an extent that they were literally sacrificing their children to the gods of the Canaanites, Molech uh, and Baal and Astarte, the goddess, the fertility goddess of the, of the Canaanites. And they had, they had taken God's temple that was supposed to be solely used for his purpose and they turned it into a house of gods. And they had other gods and other images and those things, things that God had forbidden. And they thought, the priests and, and the false prophets at that time, thought it was okay because God allowed them, he gave them so much room to try to minister to them and try to woo them back and send the prophets, bring them back, but they wouldn't listen. And Jeremiah, he came in on the tail end of that. When the Babylonians, God had promised, he said that he would send a nation to conquer the nation of, Israel, of, of Judah, uh, the city of Jerusalem. And he sent the Babylonians under a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and they came in a couple different waves. The first time they came, they, they took so many captives with them. The second time they came again and they took more captives. And finally, the third time, uh, they came and they destroyed the city. They, they burned it down. They tore down Solomon's temple. They tore down the walls, breaches in the walls. It was, became just a, a heap of rubble. And with Jeremiah, he tried, to, he tried to warn them. He would say, listen, you need to turn from your wicked ways. You've, you've uh, hewn out cisterns. You've, you're, you're going to the wrong places for relief, for, for water, for sustenance. You need to be going to the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they kept refusing. And Jeremiah, he got beat up. He got thrown in prison. They threw him in a sewer one time and let him stay down there. I thought he was going to die. Uh, they put him in stocks. They beat him up. They called him names. And, and all this time, Jeremiah was like saying, hey, Lord, I'm, I'm tell them what you want me to tell them, and I'm getting beat up. And, uh, and, and, and the thing on top of everything was they just weren't listening. So eventually, eventually, true to the word of the prophet, the Babylonians came. Uh, and they destroyed the city. And they took everybody captive. And they left a few behind. They left a few of the lower sorts behind just to, just to be there. And they, they came to Jeremiah, the leader of the Babylonian army, came to Jeremiah and gave him the option. They realized that Jeremiah was a man of God. And they came and they gave him the option. They said, you can come back with us to Babylon or you could stay here in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah decided to stay. So when he's writing Lament, this, this book of Lamentations, if you read it, it's only five chapters and if you start reading it, he begins lamenting Lamentations, where they get the name Lamentations. He begins to lament the fact that here he was in the middle of this city that God had given to his people, this glorious city of Jerusalem, which was the seat, the capital of God's people. And they let it, they let it turn to ruin. I want to ask you this. How many in here, and I know every hand will go up, so you don't have to put your hands up. You can remember a time in your life when you looked around you and said, oh, if I had just, and fill in the blank, you know, if I had just not done this, or if I, have, if I had just done this, and you look around and you see, you see like ruins in your life, and you say, oh, if I, I, if I could just go back, and what was I thinking? We've all been there one time or another. Well, here's Jeremiah sitting in the middle of Jerusalem looking at the ruins that once was a glorious place, and he's saying, if they, if they would just had listened to me, if they had just had listened to me. And all through Lamentations, just, just uh, reading, we're, we're going to end up in chapter 3, but just, just he, he says things uh, uh, in, like in, in chapter 2. And just, just to give you an example, how has the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger? God was angry. I mean, uh, you've gotten angry at your kids before, haven't you? When they don't listen to you? And you like to take them and strangle them? Well, God, God was angry. Because he sent his prophets to these, to these people, and they wouldn't listen, and they killed the prophets. He said, uh, how has the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger, and cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger? Jeremiah is looking around and saying, I remember when things were so wonderful. When they had a temple, and we had temple worship, and oh, we bring offerings and sacrifices, and you had the Passover, and all the, all the, uh, the feast days, and everything was glorious. With Jeremiah, a couple of the kings that he served under were fairly decent kings, but the ones toward the end were like really, really rotten. And he said, man, look at, look at what has happened. He goes on and he says things like, uh, uh, like in verse 5, and I'm just picking these out. You could read any of these verses and see just how things were. He said, the Lord was an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. The Lord that, that loved Israel and, and gave them everything that he wanted them to have, he became their enemy. Why? Because they wouldn't listen to him. 
They refused his grace. They refused his mercy. And, and now, it, now everything was just in shambles. Okay? That's the context. That's where this is coming from. Uh, Israel had disrespected the prophets, disrespected God. They had uh, just cast out anything that was righteous. They, they did everything their own way, and they had lost everything. And Jeremiah's sitting there in the ruins looking around saying, they just listened to me. They didn't listen to me. That's the context now. Now look at, look at chapter 3. And this is where I wanted to go today before we partake of the Lord's table. As we look around and see our lives disheveled and falling apart, listen to what Jeremiah says. Starting at verse 21. He says, This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. Jeremiah says, I have, I have a memory. There's something that keeps me holding on. When I look around and see everything destroyed and everything dis, uh, just in, in, a, in ruins, there's one thing that I could hold on to. Listen, there's some things, you know, we can't depend on anything anymore. Things break down, people let you down, family members let you down, but there's one thing we can hold on, and this is it. This is the hope we have. Verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. I want to tell you something. The only reason I'm standing here today is because God had mercy on me. God could have snuffed me out any number of times in my life when I had blasphemed him, rejected his word, broken every commandment that he had ever given. God could have stuck his foot on me and squashed me out like an ant if he had wanted to. But it's of the Lord's mercies. And I say that of me. You could probably say that of yourself. It's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Why? Because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. I need, new, I need a new supply every morning. Every day when I wake up, I need a new supply of his mercy. Because I find out there was a little sign back, I don't know if it's still back there or not. It says, you know, well, Lord, today I've done well. I haven't, I haven't gotten mad at anybody. I haven't done anything wrong. Now it's time for me to get out of bed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, usually at the first time when you get out of bed and you look at yourself in the mirror, uh, okay, we need, I need his mercies every day. I need his compassion every day. They're new all the time. And they're available to us through faith in the blood of Christ. Listen to what he says. He says, great, in verse 23, they are new every morning, and there's that song we love to sing, great is thy faithfulness. Isn't his faithfulness great? Isn't his love and mercy great? This is why we celebrate the Lord's table. This is why we come to church on a Sunday morning. We come to hear his word. We come to worship him because he's so worthy. His mercy, I thank God he's merciful. He's a lot merciful than I would be. His, he has a whole lot more compassion than I could ever have. Jeremiah goes on sitting around looking at these ruins and just sitting in the middle of destruction. He says, verse 24, The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. Some of you might say, Jeremiah, you're sitting in the midst of ruins. You're sitting in the midst of a city that once was God's glorious uh, place of, of uh, leadership and worship, and now it's destroyed, and you're saying God is good. See, what Jeremiah is trying to say is, listen, even though we deserve to be erased, we're still here. There's still a remnant. And you know the story. He told Israel... He told Jerusalem that they were going to be carried into captivity for how long, Bible scholars? Anybody know? Seventy years. Remember that? They were carried into captivity for 70 years. After that 70 years, what happened? They returned. They were allowed to go back and rebuild the city. Guess what? There's a city of Jerusalem today. It's there. It's in the middle of everything. But it's God's mercy that he didn't completely wipe them out. Listen to what he says. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, in verse 25, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait, quietly wait, quiet, oh, God help us, quietly wait. <laughs> I have to say, I have to admit this, there have been times I've waited on the Lord, but I haven't been too quiet about it. <laughs> okay. It's good that a man or a woman should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. How many people know his salvation is coming? Salvation. It's coming. I don't know what kind of ruins you're sitting in right now in your life, but his salvation, if you're his, if, if, you're, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, his salvation is on the way. 
It might even, you might be, they were sitting in their ruins. You might be sitting in the ruins of your life, maybe because of something you've done. You say, God can never forgive this. His salvation is on the way. Just like his salvation was coming to Israel. He was going to restore Israel back to their land. But he had to allow them to go through that time because they had disobeyed him. Listen, it's good for a man that should uh, both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Verse 27, it is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. I wish I had got saved younger than I did. <laughs> Everybody say amen. This church is full of people who got saved old. <laughs> okay, you know, some folks, some folks got saved real young. Thank God for the youngsters, you know. They got saved when they were young. That's a good thing. Praise the Lord. I wish I got saved when I was about six. I waited till 30 years. I till 29 years before I come to know the Lord. He says, he sits alone and keeps silence because he has borne it upon him. He puts his mouth in the dust, if so be there, there may be hope. He gives his cheek to the, him that smites him. He is filled full with reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever, thank God. The Lord will not. Listen, his salvation is coming. I don't care what you've done or who you've hurt or who, who you've done. It doesn't matter. If you're his, his salvation is coming. There might be a time of probation. There might be a time of struggling. There might be a time of correction. But his salvation is coming. It's promised in his word. He says, verse 32, But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Listen, now we're going to go to another passage here in a minute, but I want, you, I want you to get a hold of this. I've heard people say, God, why are you doing this to me? Have you ever felt that? Sometimes we know why God's doing it to us. Let's face it. Sometimes we know we suffer the consequences of decisions we make. Sometimes we go through things and we don't even understand why. But I know this much. It says it right here. It says, though he caused grief, Yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. There's deliverance coming. There's healing coming. There's, there's a change coming. There's a restoration coming. Whatever it is, you're, whatever kind of mire you're stuck in, whatever kind of ash heap you're sitting on, there's a restoration coming. Whatever destruction has happened around you, either your fault or somebody else's, restoration and healing and wholeness is on its way. The salvation, wait upon God. His salvation is coming. His word says so. This is for believers. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you can nod off. But this is for believers. If, G if you belong to Christ, you might say, I haven't been doing what I should be doing. All right? He'll take care of that. If you're his, he's not going to abandon you anymore than he would his son Jesus Christ. Because we're in him. He allowed Jesus to hang on that cross. Jesus said, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He allowed darkness to come upon the face of the, of the earth when Jesus was hanging there. But he was still his son. And he rose him up in three days after he died. See, salvation is coming. Deliverance is coming. Healing is coming. Restoration is coming. Newness is coming. Every, it's coming. It's on its way. If you're his, it's coming. You don't have to be, you know, Satan will lie to you and say, man, you're done. You're your goose is cooked. Do you ever hear that? Listen, what we're, what we're going to do today, we're going to celebrate when Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant written in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins of many. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of my sins. That's not a blank check for me to go out and do whatever I feel like doing. But when I fall and when I stumble and when I look around and find myself in desolation because of something I've done, I can know that there's restoration coming. There's a rebuilding coming. It's, it's coming. Now, I want you to look at one more passage, and we're going to take communion. Turn with me over to the New Testament, and I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And we want to look at chapter 2. Okay. Paul wrote this letter to the church in the city of Ephesus. And many consider this to be the church letter because it deals with the doctrine of the church, the body of Christ. Not just the people in this building. This isn't the only church. The church is the body of Christ. The church is all who have put their faith and trust in Jesus. 
Okay, now, listen to what he says. And you, say me. If you're saved, okay, say me. And me, has he quickened or made alive? When you see that word quicken in the New Testament, it means to be made alive. And you has he quickened who were what? Dead in trespasses and sins. He was, who, me? Me? Me, I was dead. I was a dead man. I was a walking dead man. I was on my way to hell before I met Jesus Christ. I was in my trespasses and sin. And you know what? I liked it. <laughs> I did. And my flesh liked it. Okay? Listen, he describes this. Listen. Wherein in time past, I hope in time past, you walked according to the course of this world. Everything I did... I, I never gave God one thought about what I was doing. It was always, you know, what's best for me, what's going to make me feel good. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who's he? Satan, sure. That's why we say, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> He's the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or lifestyle. That's another one in the New Testament. When you see the word conversation, it usually means lifestyle, especially in the King James. Uh, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh. We all lived according to even, we might not have even believed, I didn't even believe in a devil. You might not have even believed in a devil. But if you're not following Jesus Christ, you're living according to his principles, whether you like it or not. So you can say, I don't believe in gravity. You're still going to fall off a building if you jump off. He says, he says, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Before I knew Christ, I was living in a shambles. I was living in destruction and desolation. I'm, it, seemed, it seemed in my life, my history was, Every time I started going two steps forward, I would like shoot myself in the foot. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And find myself laying around looking at the, at the remnants, at the destruction, saying, how did this happen? What happened? And finally got to the point where I said, things ain't working. This isn't working. I see, I see all this stuff that I've caused. Sometimes I've caused it. I cause things with my mouth. You ever cause a destruction with your mouth? You can cause a lot of problems with this, can't you? We talked about that a few weeks ago. We won't go into that again. See, I, I looked around, I, and, I, and, and I realized by nature I was a child of wrath. I was on my way to hell. And I looked around, and I said, this ain't right. And thank God for his mercy and his compassion the Lord's mercies are new every morning. I'm so thankful he didn't give up on me. I'm so thankful that when somebody would try to witness to me with the gospel, I did, and I told them to get away from me and leave me alone and probably use some words I can't use in church, and I would just... I'm so thankful he didn't snuff me out. When I would make fun of people that were Christians and talking in tongues. huh? Amen. Talk about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I don't think it counted back then. But I, 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 would, I, would, I, would, I would ridicule stuff like that. Look at them goofy people acting crazy. If, if I had walked in a church like this when I was 25 years old and I seen people dancing, well, I, I can flag that these people are nuts. Crazy. Go out and make fun of them. But verse 4 says this. But God. But God, but that, that's, those two words right there, those two words right there would be, should be enough to make us jump through the ceiling. But, but, but he, could have, he could have snuffed us out. He could have thrown us out. He could have fired us. He could have sent us to hell. But God, who is what? Rich in, I need mercy. I don't need justice. I don't need a hearing. I need mercy. We all need mercy at the hands of God. That's something, that's a grace that's not deserved. Not a single one of us in here deserves to go to heaven. 
Not a single one of us in here are worthy to be a child of God. Not a single one of us. But it's his mercy. It's new every morning. If he judged me according to what I think sometimes, he'd be looking for a new path. If he, if he judged me sometimes according to what, the things that things my heart, you know, things will rise up in my heart, it might not come out, but I'll tell you what, it's, uh, it's an awful hard not to let it. You all know what I'm talking about. I thank God for his mercy. New every morning. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, I don't know why he loved me. There was nothing in me worth loving. See, I'm, I'm putting me in there, but you could put you in there. Because it applies to all of us. The God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, I was dead, I was in desolation like Jeremiah sitting in the middle of that city. Everywhere I looked around me, I didn't see any hope for anything. When I was dead in sins, he's quickened us together with Christ. He's given us life in Christ, new life and life more abundantly is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. It's ours. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad your life has been. It doesn't matter how much you've messed up since you've been a Christian. His mercy's still there. It wasn't just like what well, was there when we first got saved and then it went away. They're new every morning. They're new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. When we're faithless, when we don't even know enough to believe in what he says, he's still faithful. It says, by grace are you saved. Verse 6, and he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look what he's done. Believers. I say, you don't know what I did last night. It doesn't undo what Jesus did. It doesn't undo the blood. It doesn't undo the mercy of God. He says, and here's why. Why did God do this? See, now, see, we get a little mixed up. We think God did this for us. We think it's all about us, really. Come on, let's face it. When you were out in the world, and some of us even now, we think it's all about us, all about me. What I do, what I want, what I can, where I can go, what, you know, the stuff I want. Let me tell you something. I mean, God can bless us. He blesses us with healing. He blesses us with provision. He blesses us with stuff. That's, he can do that, but it's not about us. He's not doing it because we earn it. He's not doing it because we deserve it. He's doing it for this. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. It's all about him. If God has blessed you, it's about him. If God heals your body, it's to bring him glory. If God has given you a talent or an ability, it's about his glory. When we worship God, it's not about us, it's about him. When we get up to sing a song or dance a dancer, it's not about letting people look and see how good we do. It's about him. He's the reason why we're saved. He's the, re he's, the one, he's the reason why Jesus gave his life, to give glory to God. We're, we're, like, we're like trophies for him. He can say, look at my love, look at my mercy, look at my grace. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not about you. It's not about you. I thank God that he's allowed me to be saved, but it's not about me. He didn't save me because I'm worthy, because I'm worth it. He saved me because I bring him glory. It's, for, it's about him. I want to let folks know that, you know, my salvation, what I do, whatever, it's not about me. I want to give glory to him. See, that's, that's, that's the basis and foundation of all ministry. At least it should be. It, it should be. See, sad to say, there's a whole lot of folks who get up and do ministry, and it, they make it about them. Okay, it's like, look how good I do, you know, look how good I play. Look how good I sing, look how good. 
if they're doing that, they might as well just go down, you know, Blind Pig Saloon and do it and down there at the open stage night, you know. But when we come in, it's not about us. It's about him. It's about him. This, what we do this morning, it isn't about us. It's about him. We reap the benefits of faith in Christ. Salvation, eternal salvation, eternal security, uh, promise of the presence of being, uh, being in the presence of the Father in heaven for all of eternity. The gift of the Spirit, it says in Romans, we have not been given the spirit of fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we can cry, Abba, Father. Those are all the benefits we reap. But listen, it's not about us. It's not about, it's about him. That's why Jeremiah said that was his hope. When he looked around and saw the desolation of Jerusalem, and he said, what a ruin. He still had hope because he knew that God would get the glory somewhere down the line. That was his hope. That's what we've got to hold on to. The God that we believe in, the Christ that we hold as our Savior. He's the one who justifies us. He's the one who makes us holy. He's the one who gives us wisdom. He's the one. It's all about Him. I want to tell you something, saints. When we start thinking about what we get out of the, out of the equation... See, that's why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things. It's all about him. If we find out what he wants, if we find out what his heart is, if we find out what his will is, I want to tell you something. Then all the rest, everything that happens from that point on, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It might not be what we have applied for, but it's going to be good. Because I'll tell you something, God knows a whole lot more than we do what we, what we need. I thank God he hasn't given me some of the things I've asked for. And he's given me a few things I hadn't asked for that I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I thank you, Lord. You know, wasn't asking for this, but it came. Why? Because I'm, I'm learning to seek first his kingdom. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. This is about him. This is about him. We want to partake of the Lord's table this morning. And uh, perhaps somebody can uh, alert the kids downstairs that we're getting ready to take communion. Before we do, I want to ask you this question. Very important question. I said earlier that our only requirement to take communion is that you be born again and saved. That Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Somebody might say, well, I don't know what that means. I'm going to tell you what it means. It means turning your life over to him. Making him Lord of your life. See, the word says he'll, he'll receive us. Somebody might say, well, I'm not ready yet. I'm not prepared. I've got to get some things done. Listen, you can never be prepared. He calls. And he's calling and he's saying, come to me. Come to me as you are. I'll take you. I'll clean you up. I'll make you a new creature. I'll give you hope that you don't have right now. It's hope only found through faith in Jesus Christ. I want to give you that opportunity. If you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity this morning. If, if you would like to do that, we're going to... Uh, Ms. Mide, could you come in? Play something softly here, please, as we, as we, as we pray. It's not, about, listen, it's not about a prayer. It's not about... It's about what's in your heart. If your heart is saying, I know things aren't right. If you're looking around and you're living in a, in, a, in a rubble, and you're saying, this ain't right. Jesus is saying, come to me. I'll give you a hope of deliverance. I'll give you a hope of restoration. I'll give you a hope of healing. But you've got to come to me. You've got to come to the cross. You've got to come to the blood. You've got to come to Christ. He offers that today. If there's anybody in here who would like to receive Christ as their Savior, we're just going to wait a minute while the kids come. Uh, come on, kids. Come on up and have a seat up front. If there's anybody here who needs to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, won't you come? Won't you come? Just give a minute. Don't be ashamed and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid.